good afternoon. I'm Karen Harvey from the University of Birmingham and uh, it's great to be with you. Today I'm going to take you back to early 18th century England to a case that's occupied my research for around the past 10 years and is the subject of my recent book and which became intriguing news in the autumn of 1726. So on Saturday, the 22nd of October in that year, 1726, the British Journal published this, the first newspaper notice about the case of a woman called Mary Toft. They write from Guildford that three women working in a field saw a rabbit, which they endeavoured to catch, but they could not, they all being with child at that time. One of the women has since, by the help of a man midwife, been delivered of something in the form of a dissected rabbit with this difference that one of the legs was unto like a tabby cat's and is now kept by the said man midwife at Guildford. Well, news of the case spread very quickly. This notice was republished in several other newspapers and soon the story was being given many more column inches. The front page of the Daily Journal on the 14th of November in 1726 brought breaking news. From Guildford, the journalist wrote, comes a strange but well attested piece of news that a poor woman who lives at Godalming near that town, who has a husband and two children now living with her, was about a month past delivered by Mr. John Howard, an eminent surgeon and man midwife living at Guildford of a creature resembling a rabbit. Well, this report gave details about the animal deliveries now as you saw, confirmed as rabbits, the parts, the numbers of deliveries, as well as the chronology. And it also provides what's going to become the standard explanation for those deliveries in what was the first account from the woman herself. The woman hath made an oath, the journalist reported, that two months ago, being working in a field with other women, they put up or chased a rabbit, who running from them, they pursued it, but to no purpose. This created in her such a longing to it that she, being with child, was taken ill and miscarried. And from that time, she hath not been able to avoid thinking of rabbits. Well, the news reports would become increasingly suspicious, even disbelieving before becoming actually downright vicious. But this first account presents the events in a rather straightforward way. The woman chased a rabbit and her thwarted desire for that animal meant that she then suffered a miscarriage and then birthed something like a rabbit. Well, that woman, as I said at the beginning, was called Mary Toft and she was at the centre of a remarkable set of events in early Georgian England. This version of the story the one I've just narrated to you was given by Mary Toft as early as the 5th of November when she was questioned by a doctor, Nathaniel Saint-Andre. Toft gave the following account, which he was going to publish very soon. In the spring, she was weeding in a field with other women. She chased a rabbit. And she reportedly said, this set her a longing for rabbits being then, as she thought, five weeks gone with child. The women, she said, charged her with longing for the rabbit they could not catch, but she denied it. Mary Toff then reported that she dreamt of the rabbits. She had what she called a constant and a strong desire to eat rabbits, but being very poor and indigent, she said, could not procure any. It's important to listen very carefully to those words apparently spoken by Mary Toft herself. If we're to understand this case, and why it happened. And I'll come back to those words and her voice in a moment. Well, a number of the doctors soon clustered around her and Toft was moved from Godalming in Surrey to nearby Guildford and from there to a banyo in London where this famous engraving by William Hogarth is set, where she could be observed more easily by the doctors. The case prompted a short, but sharp pamphlet debate amongst the doctors and many others. Some doctors heralded the case as a medical wonder. Others were more cautious. Well, spoiler alert, the case was exposed as a hoax. And from then on, a new wave of print culture ridiculed all the doctors for their naivety. 
In the process, Toph was cast as a scheming, as an evil woman who'd set out to hoodwink these smart men. Hogarth's engraving dramatises the actions of the doctors in particular and their credulity. And it suggests, I think, in Mary Toff's exaggerated posture and her facial expression, that she was in fact a consummate performer. Well, the hoax might seem unfathomable from our early, uh, our late perspective. So how was it possible? Well, it was possible because of something called the theory of the maternal imagination. The case reactivated this actually very old, classical, ancient idea that women's thoughts, very often their thwarted desires, could affect their unborn child. Galen, Aristotle, Pliny, they'd all written about how what a pregnant woman saw could make such an impression on her that this literally passed through her senses, through her sensorium, to make a literal impression on her mind, which was then imprinted on her fetus and became a monstrous birth. For some, this case of Mary Toft appeared to prove once and for all that this classical theory was in fact true. For the first time, doctors thought they were witnessing a monstrous birth in action. And of course, the prestige of being the doctor who could claim the case for himself was a real motivating factor for them right from the start, as they each hurried into print with their definitive account of the case. As that doctor, Saint Andre, put it, he was desirous of being convinced personally of a fact of which there was no instance in nature. The urgency of the case meant that these doctors travelled at the most unsociable hours. Richard Manningham, another doctor involved, was exhorted to stay up late one night in order to receive Saint Andre in the early hours of the morning. Well, as it turned out, some of these doctors moved too quickly. Preserved for posterity in print was Nathaniel Saint Andre's attempt um, here on the left. Um, to demonstrate the truth of these monstrous births that was then subsequently revealed as a hoax when the print on his pamphlet was barely dry. Now this book used a number of techniques to impress upon the reader that it was most certainly a truthful account. The title page of the book, a short narrative of an extraordinary deliver delivery of rabbits announced his role as surgeon and anatomist to his majesty, the king. In the book and after examining the case, he underscores the veracity, the truth of his findings with another hint of royal approval, reporting that all these facts were verified before his majesty on Saturday, November the 26th. Witnesses that he quotes are described as a man of known probity and character. And he gives plenty of details of the births themselves. His first delivery was of the trunk of a rabbit. His companion, Mr. Molyneux, took part of the lung of that animal and put it in water. Well, the fact that it rose to the surface indicated, of course, that it had been living outside of Toft's body. It was a living creature that had breathed air, a dead giveaway, we would think. Saint Andre also found what appeared to be fish bones in the gut of a later delivery of a cat. He examined Toft internally and found no blood or tearing, but he examined her breasts and he found what he described as milk in one of them. Richard Manningham, that other doctor who published a pamphlet, found the same milk-like substance in her breasts, but Manningham also found that her cervix was closed. He said it was closed and contracted in such a manner that it would not receive so much as the point of a bodkin into its orifice, let alone, of course, any part of a rabbit. Manningham also commented that the movements of Toff's body seemed unlike anything he'd seen before. But Manningham was skeptical right from the start, noting how, for example, the membrane that he'd removed from Toff's body was suspiciously, he said, like a hog's bladder. It was my opinion, he wrote in his pamphlet, that that, that membrane never came out of the uterus. <laughs> 
Well, this debate amongst the doctors was vociferous and sometimes descended into downright ungentlemanly insult slinging. Yet all the doctors proceeded in a rational and a methodical way with regards to Mary Toff's body. And it's worth noting, I think, that they were interested in her body, not her person. Their lack of attention to her as an individual, she's barely mentioned by name, for example, is in part a comment on doctor-patient relations and the growing authority of men over the processes of childbirth and the female body. This is the period when man midwifery starts to develop so successfully for normal childbirth deliveries, not just obstructed deliveries. These men's pamphlets and the other reports detail behaviour towards Toft, which I think most of us would probably describe as cruel. Manningham, for example, when the room contained what he described as many persons of distinction, announced if there was any person present willing to examine her, that they do it while her pains were upon her. Accordingly, he said, several persons did examine her. So these men examined the physical evidence before them, both Mary's body and the animal parts that came from this, subjecting all of this physical matter to a series of tests. Their tests produced the same results, but the doctors nevertheless differed in their interpretation of the data. Now, is this context, the medical context, that historians have tended to focus on in explaining this remarkable case. And I talk about this context in my book, The Imposterous Rabbit Breeder. The extent to which these men rushed to claim the monstrous birth as their own, the way they vied with one another for professional credit, and the degree to which they furthered new knowledge about the hidden processes of reproduction, these are all really important. In the final chapter of my book, I look at how our present understanding of pregnancy and birth is on the one hand quite different, um, but at the same time um, still bears parallels with these men's attitudes to childbirth and pregnancy. But I don't think this context, this approach is enough. And in the book, one of my real ambitions is to recuperate Mary Toff's own voice, to place her experiences at the centre of the narrative and to analyse the case from the perspective of her motivations. I'll share some of my findings in this area with you today. In the rest of the talk, I'm then going to situate the case in a wider context, but not the medical context. Instead, I'm going to argue that it's the world of 18th century politics that's particularly significant to understanding why this case caused such a furore. So let's start with women's experiences then. And let's start with the woman at the centre of the case. Mary Toft was born in Godalming on the 21st of February 1703 to John and Jane Denier. In 1720, when she was just 17, she married the 18 year old Joshua Toft, a wool cloth worker. Their first son, was born in March 1723, um, though that child appears to have died in July of that year. The birth of their son James followed in July 1724. Having left her natal family to live with her husband, she was now firmly part of the Toft household. Mary's husband's family was really important to the case. His mother, Joshua Toft's mother, Anne Toft, was a key figure in the whole affair. Indeed, Mary Toff's life, like that of many other women of, the, of this time, was lived largely in the company of women. Mary contributed to the family income by working as an agricultural day labourer. She reported, as you heard, that she first saw rabbits while she was working in a field with other women. Three weeks after the first animal parts appeared, she said that she was taken ill as she worked with other women, this time in a hop garden. Interestingly, these female workers appear to have formed a supportive group. Mary reported that they that worked with me worked their dinner hours that I might go sooner. Otherwise, I had lost a penny for they worked for me. What Mary Toff was describing there 
was when she had to leave the hop garden, the other women covered for her. Presumably their sympathy was in part a response to her pregnant state. The narrow glimpse of the world of female agricultural workers offered by Mary Toft's report suggests that this group might sometimes pull together in solidarity. And there was surely another woman facilitating Toft's work on that day, perhaps every day, because Toft doesn't appear to have taken her 18 month old James with her to either the field or the hop garden. Someone was providing childcare for James whilst his mother went out to work. Women were friends, confidants, and they were also colleagues. So how do I know this much about Mary Toff's working and social life? Well, this slide is uh, an image of the first page of the first confession of Mary Toft. The way I'm reconstructing Mary Toff's experiences and her wider world is in using these incredibly rich but also very difficult documents that we have for the case. There are 36 pages of rough copies of three separate confessions or statements that were given by Mary Toft in December 1726. The first two statements were given on the 7th and the 8th of December and the third was given on the 12th of December in the Westminster Bridewell prison following Mary Toff's indictment for imposture. I'm going to come on to that later. All three of the confessions were taken down by another doctor, James Douglas, in whose papers they now survive. And they were all part of a formal legal process um, that took place in the presence of the London Justice of the Peace, Thomas Clarges, as part of his criminal investigation into the hoax. These documents are different partly because they're extremely messy and they're messy because James Douglas was struggling to keep up with the fast moving speech during these interrogations. Um, Richard Manningham said that the interrogations were ferocious. Nevertheless, I think we can read them closely and if we do so, we can disentangle the different voices and see that large sections of these confessions or statements are actually free-flowing descriptions from Mary Toft, interspersed with insertions from the interrogator or indications of when she's been interrupted and asked a question. So what does Mary Toft have to say about the hoax? Well, in this slide um, from, again, from the first uh, confession, you can see how she starts to describe the hoax. She describes two sets of events in the confessions. First, having had two children and having lost one of them, Mary then suffered a miscarriage. And the confessions actually provide rare and valuable evidence of one woman's way of describing and of making sense of this experience. So in the first confession, Toff begins by telling the story actually of the monstrous birth. And the bit that's highlighted reads, I was delivered of a true monstrous birth. The liver and guts came away first. But Toff was then interrupted and presumably asked to, dis to describe how she came to deliver this. She then went back in time to recount the story of the miscarriage. And the note taker squeezes this in between what she's just said. And this is the bit that he then notes down. Something came away with a flooding, she said, after I had seen some rabbits, which I longed for. She continues the description of the miscarriage and she only returns to the liver and guts of the rabbit by the third page of the confession. Well, her description of the miscarriage is lengthy and it's detailed, and I'm going to give a few more details in a moment. She claims she was five weeks pregnant when she first saw the rabbits. 17 weeks later, 22 weeks into the pregnancy towards the middle of August, she says that she was taken with a flooding and violent colic pains, which made her to miscarry. Three weeks later, she says she experienced flooding and great pain and she passed something more. 
She says that she continued to bleed for two more weeks. And in the report she gave to Saint Andre, she explained that she continued to exhibit what she described as the symptoms of a breeding woman. Milk, she said, flowed profusely from her breasts. Though she also said that as she had had children before, she thought she felt very differently from what she used to do. Finally, in late September, she was taken very ill. She sent for her mother-in-law and finally passed what she initially described as parts of a pig. Well, miscarriages can be prolonged events lasting several weeks, and that's what Mary Toft is describing here. All of the confessions begin with her description of, of flooding, of her body being open, of her passing objects, as did the description that she would later give to Saint Andre when he interviewed her. This is the same story that's been reported in the newspapers since October. It's a story that Mary Toff told for weeks, and I think it's a true account of a miscarriage that happened to her. The second event, though, and the main subject of the confessions is the hoax itself. And though, of course, it was a hoax, she did not um, reproduce rabbits. I think it's really important to note that she did experience a sequence of real deliveries. Animals were actually placed inside her body and they were taken out of her body. And naturally, this was a difficult process. Saint Andre reported um, the early pieces of animal bodies in some details. Some of them are reasonably large, for example. I could say more. These parts were hidden in Mary's body over a period of several weeks. She must have become extremely ill and she was surely lucky not to have died. The hoax then, such as it was, was actually constituted from this real physical process. And that's really important when we start to think about Mary Toff's experiences and her motivations. Most people have assigned Mary Toff quite considerable agency in their retelling of this story, both in the 18th century and in our own modern times. Quite recently, one popular historian described Toft as the Monica Lewinsky of the 1700s. The writer of a 2011 Radio 4 play um, was quoted as saying, she was someone who turned around and said, I'm bored of my life and want to change it. Well, I don't think these portrayals of Mary Toft stand up to scrutiny, really. I don't think Mary Toff was the embodiment of um, girl power or a proto-feminist agency. I don't believe that Mary Toff was either a scheming deviant or an independent modern woman making choices for herself. In fact, I don't actually think she had much agency at all during the sequence of events. Concerning the rabbit births, Mary Toff was consistent on a number of key details, one of which is the presence of women. Her mother-in-law enters early on in the story, and this marks the appearance of those unidentified animal parts. The confessions also mention the neighbour, Mary Gill, Betty Richardson, another neighbour who's forced to remove a piece of animal from Mary Toff because she's in such pain. She also mentions a Mrs. Mebbin, also from the local community. To the women that Mary mentions by name in her confessions, we could also add the shadowy women that feature on the periphery of the male doctor's viewpoint. Richard Manningham mentioned that in the Banyo, the movement of Mary's body was so violent during her pains that, quote, as I sat on the bed in company with five or six women, it would shake us all very strongly. It's a remarkable report of this um, esteemed doctor sitting on Mary Toff's bed, surrounded by women, presumably from her local community. It really speaks to the authority of these women and the right they had to be there in the birthing chamber. Following her miscarriage and the passing of several strange parts, Toff says, a woman whom I don't know if I was to be put to death came to find her brother to grind a stone. So another woman appears in the story. 
Unlike the other women that Toff describes, this nameless woman was not a neighbour or from the local community. She and her husband travelled about the country. After seeing Toft in pain and being told what was happening, this woman suggested the hoax to Toft. And Toft reportedly said to her, I told her such a thing would not be done. She said it could and desired to try. Well, this woman was the wife of a knife grinder. She is connected to a suitably intimidating occupation and she does wield a knife with which she cuts the dead animals. Now Toff's account changes across the three confessions that she gave and this shadowy, nameless, rather intimidating woman morphs into the figure of her mother-in-law. Anne Toft is consistently described as a frightening figure of authority. I was loath she should touch me, Mary Toft says of her mother-in-law in one of the confessions. And by the final confession, Mary answers her interrogator's opening question very clearly. Who first put you upon it? Or who first contrived, she's asked. And her response is unequivocal. Anne Toff's my husband's mother. So the hoax by Mary Toff's account and supported by some of the men around her, the hoax took shape in the context of a group of female kin and neighbours and was increasingly limited to just a few family members and women. Now this all brings to mind the ritual of the lying in or the birthing ritual in the chamber in which older and authoritative female kin and neighbours exercise power over the bodies of younger women. Toff noted in her confessions um, that all the women around her had some kind of authority over her. First on the scene was that woman Mary Gill, who must have been regarded as particularly expert because she is called before the local doctor John Howard to inspect these suspect um, animal parts. Betty Richardson was described by Mary Toft as a silk stocking maker's wife. That's a skilled trade. Mrs. Mebbin, who removed a foot, was described as a gentlewoman. Toft's references to these women's relative social status suggests her acute awareness of status dynamics. Her experience, Toff's experience of this female dominated environment was characterized, she says, by conflict much more than comfort. And I think this explains why Mary Toff took part in this painful and dangerous hoax. Essentially, I think this was a team effort and one in which women played an instrumental role drawing on their authority in matters of the female body and using this authority to compel a young woman to participate in a painful and a risky venture. Well, all this raises another question. Why might the women have orchestrated such a hoax? From Anne Toff's perspective, her young daughter-in-law perhaps had not fulfilled her reproductive purpose. Or perhaps there were familiar relationships that had somehow gone awry between Joshua Toft, Mary and her mother. This was perhaps a complicated world of interpersonal relationships, one that we may never properly get the full measure of, whatever rich documents we might find. These issues concerning power relations amongst families and particularly between women are ongoing today around childbirth and pregnancy. And at the end of the book, I talk about how Toff's case gives us the opportunity to reflect upon women's experiences today. But before I leave you, there's another important context that I want to explore here. And that's not so much about the private and the interpersonal, but instead about the public and the political. So let's take us back to Godalming with this image um, that uh, I've taken um, of Godalming uh, Town Centre. Well, this is a modern day Godalming, of course. In 1725, Godalming had a population of around two to three thousand people. It was actually quite a large, small town. 
but it wasn't necessarily thriving. Though the woolen industry had brought prosperity to Godalming, this was actually in decline by the early 18th century. And that's important because, as I mentioned, Mary Toff's husband, Joshua, was a young cloth worker and he was affected by this downturn. Poor families like the Toffs were increasingly subject to the regulation and the intervention of local governors through a very complex and dense web of institutions that governed the lives of poor families. Importantly, the, the network of the Toffs and their community was almost entirely separate from this tightly knit network of governors, the chief inhabitants of the town. And this was exemplary of increasingly marked divisions between the poor and an emerging middling sort across England. Well, whilst we're severely limited in our efforts to reconstruct Toff's local community, one document is very suggestive. This is a list of men who appeared to answer for trespass on the pond of one James Stringer of Godalming at the Guildford Quarter Sessions in July 1726, so the year of the hoax. Now this list was drawn up in the period between Mary Toff's miscarriage and the birth of her rabbits. It shows that there were tensions in the town. The case involved 38 men charged, quote, for a trespass in entering the ground or pond of James Stringer covered with water with an intent to steal fish. That phrase covered with water means that they were wet. James Stringer, the proprietor of this particular fish pond, had previously been an appraiser for the hundred of Godalming, one of the networks of governance in the town. He's one of the local governors then. Now, given the scale of this alleged trespass, 38 men are listed. This must have been an act of premeditated collective action or protest. Village ponds were certainly one of the sites where anti-enclosure protests were taking place at this very time. Now, to understand this, it's important to note that Godalming was very close to the heart of the area in which a group called the Wolf and Blacks, as they were known, were active. These groups were armed men who went about trying to steal animals and threatening violence against people and property during the decade of the hoax. Early 18th century Whig politicians in the government were seeking to protect their land and their property by extending capital punishments to a much greater, a much greater range of crimes. And particularly through one act, the Waltham Act or the Black Act of 1723, which was intended to target these very groups of men. The theft of fish, if not rabbits, was a significant minority of the Waltham Black's actions during the 1720s. Although almost 60% of the offences committed by these men in this area um, between 1722 and 24 were for poaching deer, nearly 15% were for stealing fish. So whether or not the trespass on James Stringer's pond was undertaken by these specific men, it was nevertheless a highly provocative action given the context of protests and violence against property and land that was taking place. Now, importantly, this list includes Mary Toff's husband, Joshua. He was at the pond protest. Now, there's no evidence of a direct connection between Joshua Toff's action of trespass on James Stringer's pond and Mary Toff's rabbit hoax, but perhaps they were linked. Perhaps they were both protests by the poor. There was a long social history of tensions in agricultural communities focused on the farming of rabbits. First of all, rabbits had traditionally been an elite item, both the meat and the fur. Warrens were also traditionally owned by the local landowner. Despite the construction of high walls and other methods of deterring poachers though, the rabbits encroached on common land to eat the food of the sheep and the cattle upon which commoners and tenants' livelihood depended. One writer in 1650 described how landowners enclosed land 
and rabbits, quote, letting them increase, that they may eat up the labours of poor men to their great hindrance and discouragement. As the prices of wool and grain declined by the middle of the 18th century, farmers in sandy areas, as Godalming was, became suited to Warren, were suited to Warrens, and those landowners turned then to Warrening, to rabbits. The decline of the clothing trade in some areas thus went hand in hand with the growth of commercial Warrening. And this is what appears to have happened in Godalming. This is really significant given that Joshua Toft was a poor cloth worker. His livelihood is being replaced by warrening, apparently. Secondly, the legal status of rabbits was changing from wild game to enclosed animals, and this rendered them a form of private property. The taking of game was poaching, but the taking of property was theft and it was subject to much harsher punishment. Rabbits were one of the animals that were protected by increasingly harsh laws. In and around Godalming, there was a long history of rabbit farming and large warrens in the area were still in the hands of the local landowner. Mary Toff said that having chased the rabbits in the field, quote, she dreamt that she was in a field with those two rabbits in the lap and awaked with a sick fit, which lasted till morning. From that time for above three months, she had a constant and strong desire to eat rabbits, but being very poor and indigent could not procure any. Toff's own admission that she was chasing rabbits was therefore tantamount to a confession of attempted theft from a local landowner and her apparent reproduction of her own rabbits was surely also a highly provocative act. What more eloquent way to respond to such privilege and the exclusion of the poor from it than a poor labouring woman producing her own rabbits? We cannot safely con conclude though that Mary Toff's hoax was a protest to mirror that of her husband's just three months earlier. The motivations of Toft and or of her family are elusive. But turning to the responses of the case, those responsible for law and order certainly viewed the case as, sorry, certainly viewed the case in a social and political rather than medical context. Widespread fears about disrupted social relations and a broader crime wave in the 1720s were causing many elite men to double their efforts in seeking out and punishing criminals. And some of those very men were involved in our case, the rabbit hoax. They were also involved in the trespass in which Joshua Toft took part. So one of the signatories to the July 1726 recognizance for trespass was Thomas Second Baron Onslow, who'd investigated the rabbit hoax in Godalming and Guildford, interviewing witnesses at his house, Clandon Park, in early December 1726 in his capacity as Lord Lieutenant for Surrey. Onslow was one of those Whig landowners in the southern counties who were suffering at the hands of the Blacks. And only in September 1723, an attempt had been made on his life by a man called Edward Arnold. Arnold claimed he was using the gun to shoot rabbits, but had accidentally shot at the Lord. Arnold reportedly explained that, quote, Lord Onslow and King George had got all the money so that he could get none. Onslow was the local landowner on whose land Godalming rabbits grazed. Well, in November 1726, Mary Toft was moved from Guildford to a banyo in Leicester Fields. And this was where the case came within the jurisdiction of that London JP, Thomas Clarges. It was Clarges who play, played a critical role in bringing the case to its legal climax, setting in train the intensive few days of questioning that led to those three confessions. He arrested her on a charge of fraud and brought the case to the Westminster Quarter Sessions. 
Clarges had been involved in a notorious case of deer hunting by some notorious blacks in Surrey in July 1725. His aggression during his interrogations of Toft was commented upon by contemporaries. Richard Manningham, himself not particularly sympathetic to her pain and distress, reported that he was forced to intercede because she was, quote, so strictly examined by clergies. It's this wider political context that explains why these law enforcers were quite so vigorous in prosecuting a poor woman who, after all, had simply pretended to give birth to rabbits. And there's one final aspect to this political context that's important, and that's the involvement of the king, George I. He sent several of his doctors to investigate the case in Surrey. He invited Saint Andre to present evidence on the case to him. And Mary was moved to Leicester Fields in London at his request, as newspapers very publicly announced. So George I was thoroughly implicated and open to ridicule in what was soon to be revealed as one almighty hoax. The JP Thomas Clarges was most likely operating on behalf of the King. And this is surely why the full force of the criminal justice system was brought to bear on this case. Well, in the end, Toft spent four months at hard labour in the local Westminster Bridewell prison. She was finally released without charge. Why? She was indicted for fraud and imposture, but no one had lost any money, so they couldn't get her on fraud. And quite simply, there is no crime of impersonating a woman who gives birth to rabbits on the statute books. So she went back to relative obscurity in Godalming, though her hoax was remembered and recorded for posterity in the local parish registers. On the 4th of February, 1728, they record the christening of her daughter, Elizabeth. Being her first child, they record, after her pretended rabbit breeding. On the 12th of June, 1745, the registers remarked on the burial of her husband, Joshua Toft, rabbit man, buried. And finally, on the 13th of January, 1745, 63 in a remarkable entry in the parish registers, the record of her burial preserved forever her notoriety. Mary Toft, widow, buried, the imposterous rabbit breeder. That's the end of the talk. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, I look forward to your comments in the chat and I hope you very much enjoy the rest of the festival.